So I'm here to share a little bit about Alberta's experience with uh, invasive muscle pr uh, prevention and an innovation tool that we have incorporated full time into our program, which is the use of trained muscle detecting dogs. So I don't normally make poor Hilo sit through my presentations. We may hear some whining and uh, yawning and I apologize if that's the case. I'll try and pick it up then if that's, if that's so. Um, so invasive muscles. Uh, as Stephanie said, they came from the Black and the Caspian Seas. They were introduced into North America in the late 1980s. They came in the ballast tanks of ships, so those big boats picked up the water, used it for balance to get across the sea, came to the east, eastern seaboard, dropped out that water, and those mussels were able to thrive because they don't have any natural predators here in North America. Um, and as I said earlier, they reproduce very rapidly. And so there's nothing there that's uh, eating them. What they're doing is they're actually eating all the good phytoplankton in the water. And that's completely altering the food web because there's um, nothing that's uh, keeping them in check. So they reproduce rapidly. And what we're really worried about is they attach to any hard surface. So that's how you know that it's an invasive mussel and not one of the freshwater mussels that we have in BC and Alberta is because they have these little threads and these threads will let them attach and they'll just start to attach to each other and reproduce to any hard surface and start to clog things up. So in Alberta, for example, we have thousands and thousands of kilometers of irrigation systems. So these are buried pipes that move water through for the crops to irrigate the crops. They have canals. And if these uh, were to be infested with invasive mussels, they would just clog up and clog up. And there's nothing we can do to get rid of them. And while I was here in the Okanagan, it made me think, wow, I'm looking around at all these beautiful vineyards. And I'm sure several of them are using irrigation to keep these vines growing. And that would be a massively devastating impact to the economy around here. Um, <coughs> and as you can see, these shells are sharp. They can cut your feet. And as I said, they completely alter the food web. So I have a picture here. This is Lake Winnipeg. You can see this girl in her boots. That's my colleague. Behind it is Lake Winnipeg. Lake Winnipeg found invasive mussels two years ago. Last summer, in 2015, there was not a single mussel on that beach. This beach was completely clear. It looks like the beach you have today in Penticton. Beautiful sandy beach. One year later, completely clogged up. So that beach would not be swimmable anymore without shoes. You would not be able to lay on that beach because those muscles are so sharp. They'll scratch everyone's legs and their feet. Um, and they stink. That, like, that smells horrible there. So you're looking at lakefront property owners here um, or you know these hotels that are right in front of the beach. That's bringing in massive tourist dollars. Your um, tourist recreation will go down. Um, as well as your lakefront property is going to decrease in value. I guarantee it if you see invasive mussels. Um, this, uh, pic this other picture is while I was at Lake Winnipeg. A guy had a boat there that he had in the water all summer and he had these Christmas lights dangling down. He pulled them out and all of those mussels are the part that was in the water. So they love to migrate to the hard surfaces and attach to anything. So the impacts are incredibly devastating. <coughs> we estimate in Alberta it would cost us 75 million. So as you learned, there's nothing we can do to get rid of them. Once we have them, we have them. So then the costs that we incur our, um, you know, for maintenance. So uh, there's an example in Texas where uh, they, a lake, a lake there was infested with invasive mussels. That lake fed into a water treatment facility and they had to build a $300 million extension to that water treatment facility to reroute the water. And that, you know what, that cost went to the tax players in that region in Texas. So their water bills increased by 14% because of these invasive mussels to pay for that addition. So um, in Alberta, it would be, you know, same as British Columbia. You're looking at your water treatment facilities, your recreation lost opportunities and whatnot. So uh, massively devastating impact. And it's not, you, I know we're guessing because we don't have them right now about how much it would cost, but we look at Ontario and they tell us for a fact that they spend 70 to 90 million every year in Ontario because they have these invasive mussels. And they're getting closer. So Lake Winnipeg, very close to the east, and now Montana, um, we have to treat them as a very high risk. 
So in terms of the Alberta Prevention Program, um, we have five aspects. One is response, so that's what would we do if we do get invasive muscles, just exactly like Stephanie talked about what they did. Uh, we have introduced some great legislation very recently, so by law, if you pass a watercraft inspection station uh, without stopping, you can get uh, a fine, you can mandatory court appearance, you could go, uh, you know, it's up to the judge what he wants to do. So it's a, you know, whether you're a kayak or a canoe, any type of water vessel, by law, you have to stop at our inspection station. And a secondary aspect to that is you must pull every plug in your boat when you're transporting it on an Alberta highway. And the reason for that is these muscles can live in the microscopic sense for 30 days in standing water. So if you're in uh, you know, Tiber Reservoir in Montana with your boat and you pick up some of that water in your bilge or in any of your compartments, uh, that, those muscles could live for 30 days and it doesn't take 30 days to get over here to Lake, Ono Lake Okanagan from Montana. And so the idea is if you have to have your plugs pulled, then that, uh, then that water won't be able to be released into a secondary water body. Uh, education and outreach, that is by far the strongest tool that any program has in their toolbox. And we all follow that consistent message of clean, drain, dry, because really that's the only way that we will effectively eliminate this risk. So if boaters do their part, every time they leave a water body, they make sure there's no weeds or no muds or nothing attached, there's no water in it, it's completely dry. That's the only way that we'll effectively eliminate that risk. So, I mean, as much as we're working out there spending millions of dollars on prevention, we will never be able to inspect every single boat. And it's kind of like policing. Um, police cannot be everywhere all the time in every situation. It's up to the citizens to do their part to, to follow the rules. So it's the same with uh, watercraft inspections. We monitor our water bodies, so we're taking those microscopic samples, and that's how we can claim definitively that Alberta is muscle-free, because we are using science and the most up-to-date technology to test our water. So what I'll get into is the inspections program, and that's where we bring in the canines as an augmentation to our program. Uh, last summer, we inspected 19,000 boats in Alberta. This map shows you the point of origin of the watercraft that came through our inspection station. Almost every single state, province, and territory had a boat coming from there to Alberta. So that shows you that this is the number one vector of an introduction. Boats are moving, and they're moving all over the place. And almost all of these regions have invasive mussels. There's only four states and a couple provinces now that are still free. So we know this is a huge risk. And of those boats that we inspected last year, we had 17 that we intercepted with mussels. And of those 17, eight of them had BC as their final destination. So we intercepted them in advance uh, and were able to uh, inform BC so that we could take care of it together. Thanks for that. Thank You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. It's all me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so you often see these posters or these, you know, advertising campaigns about the muscles. And you see these propellers and these hulls that are completely covered in muscles. Well, in reality, that's not what we're seeing. The boats that come through our watercraft inspection station, tiny, tiny little mussels. So this sunflower seed is for scale to show you that is the entirety of all the mussels that were found on one massive watercraft. So they're super hard to see, and they, they seem so innocuous. They're just these tiny little things, but it's um, incredible the impact that they can have. So that's part of the reason why uh, I'm going to switch gears now to tell you about how and why we incorporated the dogs into our program. So why dogs? Well, um, when you think about humans, we perceive the landscape visually, whereas the dogs perceive it with their noses. So an average German Shepherd has about 225 million scent receptors. Humans, we only have about 5 million. So the example I like to use is if you were to walk into a house where someone's baking a cake, right away you'll be like, yeah, I smell cake. Someone is baking a cake in here. Whereas your dog was probably a block away down the street and he could smell 
the sugar, the flour, the baking soda, the cocoa, the eggs, all the different ingredients that are in that cake. So they really have this incredible ability to detect things that we can't. And people will often say to me, well, I have a, a dog and my dog is so smart. My dog would totally make a good detection dog. But in actuality, less than one in a thousand dogs has what it takes to make a good working dog. And what it really is that we're looking for is a really high ball drive. So these dogs are obsessed with the ball. And I mean like this, like they will do anything for that ball. And so when we um, look for appropriate dogs, that's really all that they care about. They could care less about all the humans in the room if there's a ball there. And these dogs also have a really high, high energy and a really uh, ability to remain focused. So that's why most of these dogs tend to be found in rescue societies because they don't make good family pets. They really need a job to do. They really need to be channeling that energy. So Working Dogs for Conservation is a nonprofit from Montana that worked with us along with the Alberta Irrigation Project Association to try and see what it would be like to incorporate dogs as part of the inspections program. So we went through three different veins, which I'm going to uh, sh uh, explain to you, uh, and that's how we landed at creating our own detection dog program. So Working Dogs for Conservation is from Montana, and they take these rescue dogs that they have assessed as being good for detection, and they go all over the world training them to detect different targets that have a high conservation value. So, for example, here they are. This is with the co-founder um, of Working Dogs, Amy Hurt, and she is with her dog in China. And they're there looking for Chinese moon bear scat because that is a species at risk due for harvesting. So that's like one example of what they can do. Here they are in Cameroon looking for cross river gorilla dung because cross river gorilla is an endangered species. And so the dogs are being, you know, are able to detect them very quickly. The handlers can collect the samples that can be analyzed later for DNA for, you know, assessing the population health. And so they, they have this like endless possibility to be trained and go all over the world to do all kinds of targets. And they actually really make good ambassadors to the program. I mean, the people in this village, I am told, they had no idea that the Cross River Gorilla was a species at risk. And so seeing the dogs brought this whole new awareness to this village. So in 2014, we partnered with Montana State and we decided, well, let's try and see what it would be like if we hired working dogs for conservation to train their dogs to detect invasive mussels on boats. So at this point, we knew that California and Minnesota had mussel detecting dogs, but these dogs were multi-purpose enforcement dogs. So these dogs were looking for poachers and they were looking for gun residue and they were looking for, you know, bear and all kinds of things that, you know, people might have in their trucks. And so they weren't actually sitting at a watercraft inspection station day in and day out. So we partnered with Montana. We called it like this international pilot because it was like sounded sexy, but really we were only like three hours across the border on either side. And we hired them to train their dogs to do this pilot. And so when I was proposing to do that to my province, I had a very senior fish and wildlife officer who was kind of against the idea. He said, you know, dogs are good, but they're really only good for public education and they're really only good for PR. And I was like, okay, well, you might be right, but in my mind, I kind of wanted to prove him wrong. So as part of that pilot project, I set up a double blind comparison trial and uh, we went to this used boat shop where we had a bunch of old boats lined up and I planted some of them with mussels, I left some of them blank, and then I brought in trained watercraft inspectors and I said, okay team, um, these are uh, high risk boats, I want you to inspect them. And what I did is I timed them and I assessed the accuracy. And then I did the same thing with the dogs and I brought the dogs in. And so we basically did a comparison trial for the accuracy and the efficiency of detecting uh, mussels on boats. And well, the results probably won't surprise anyone in this room, but the dogs outperformed in every category. So the dogs in this trial were 100% accurate in detecting the mussel fowl boats, and the humans came in at 75%. Um, and as well, the dogs 
averaged about 2.3 minutes to inspect a boat, whereas the humans were quite a bit longer, well over five or six minutes. Um, and for the dogs, that 2.3 minutes even included time for them to play with the ball after they found the muscles. So um, <laughs> it was pretty impressive. And I hid like only one tiny muscle on these boats. Like I didn't even make it obvious. So you know, it was uh, really hard for the humans to see. Um, and in some cases, I didn't even hide the muscle. I just hid the threads. So these Bissell threads are so tiny, and that's what the muscles used to attach. And the dogs had only ever been trained on muscles, were still able to detect that. So no shell and no actual muscle material, and the dogs were still accurate at assessing those boats. So due to the su success of that, we decided that we wanted to bring in these trained dogs to help us work uh, during snowbird season, because this is what spring looks like in Alberta. I don't think it looks the same here in Penticton. And we wanted to catch all of those boaters who were coming back, because we know in Alberta and BC, boaters love to go to Arizona and Nevada and California and the lower Colorado River system where there are these invasive mussels. So we said, let's bring the dogs in, get some good PR. People are waiting at the border for a long time. We don't want them to wait at our inspection station too. We want people to be happy. So we brought the dogs in for that project. And as part of that, um, we did a night pilot. So. If anyone is ever involved in any kind of inspections program anywhere in the whole Pacific Northwest, everyone will agree that the number one gap and challenge we face is boaters that travel at night, like Mr. Dan Ashton, who admitted he was coming back at night at, through the Roosevelt Station. And you know, it's true because we can't get out there and detect uh, and, and keep our inspection stations open at night. Um, and you know, I've even been on a, a forum, and it's an Idaho outdoorsman forum and boaters were actually talking about ways if you travel after dark you can specifically avoid these inspection stations so like they're purposely avoiding us after dark and same thing with commercial haul boats because you know truckers they have deadlines and they have timelines and if they have six boats loaded up on a trailer we're going to be delaying them for quite a while so they like to avoid us at night so what I did was, again, I kept our inspection station open for two weeks till midnight with these dogs that uh, we had hired. And uh, over the course of those two weeks, I sent in two boats that I had planted with one tiny mussel. And the watercraft inspectors went out and said, we can't look at the boat. It's dark. It's shadowy. Sent the dogs around. And uh, both times, the dogs totally found the mussel after dark. So we did see that it would be one way to address that gap and that challenge of inspecting boats at night. So that led us to the conservation canine program that we have now fully incorporated into Alberta with our own detection dog program. So we hired working dogs for conservation and they um, helped us source the dogs and resource the handlers within our department. And we traveled down to California to work with the Department of Fish and Wildlife trainer there, because um, they've been training dogs for several years, and they have mussels in California. So we did this really intensive and very specialized, it was about 140 hours of training for both of us, the dogs and the handlers. And then we brought in someone to test us at the end of it, who was an external, because we didn't want to just come back to Alberta and be like, yeah, we got this. Like, we really wanted to be able to say definitively that the dogs and the handlers were working uh, to the cap capabilities that they should be for detecting muscles on boats. So I'll show you a little bit about how we train the dogs. First thing we're doing is teaching them to um, alert to the actual odor of muscles. And we make it really fun for them, because remember, they're really driven by the ball. So these are called hair boxes. You hide the muscles in one of the box, and if the dog finds it, the ball will jump out, and it's a great big fun party. And then we have a thing called a detection wall, the scent wall. And this is teaching the dogs that they need to go up and down like you would on a boat to put your nose in things like the through hull fittings and whatnot, where water drains out. And behind the wall, we would hide things like, well, for sure the muscles, but we'd also hide distraction odors like the sandwich and uh, you know, gasoline and motor oil and things that dogs would find on a boat to teach them that that doesn't pay. It's only the muscles that pays. And then finally, we would teach the dogs to pinpoint exactly where the odor is on the boat. So they could identify at a very small location exactly where the muscles were, because we have to be able to verify that. So our dogs display what's called a passive alert. And so that means that when they detect the odor, they will sit 
And then we as handlers will say, show me exactly where it is, and then the dog will point out with his nose. And then they get their reward. So this is their paycheck. This is why they go to work every single day. It's, it's only for this ball. And that's the only time they actually get to play with this special toy is when they're working. And so for them, going to work, like I'm sure most of you would agree, is the most fun thing in their lives. <laughs> So we hand out these little cards that say you've been sniffed. So uh, depending on which dog and which station you go through, people can collect them. And we do have the 2017 version. If anyone wants one of my dog's business cards, you're welcome to grab one. <coughs> and so I'll introduce you to our team, um, Heather and Diesel. Diesel is a chocolate lab cross. And he came from a rescue agency in San Diego because, as I said, they don't make good family pets. So someone gave Diesel up and our contractors assessed him as being really good for our program. And so this is really cool, but a, a volunteer um, in California in his very own airplane with his own fuel picked up Diesel and flew him all the way to Montana where he could be driven across the border to become part of our program. So it's kind of got a really neat story. There's like all kinds of media around him leaving California to come live in Alberta. And then we have Seuss. Uh, Seuss is a German Shepherd, also from a rescue society. And um, Seuss is kind of like, I kind of call them our badass team because Seuss is like super serious. He's like, you hired me to do a job. He goes in there, he inspects the boat, he finds a muscle, and then he's like, out of there. Like, okay, when's the next one coming? So he's a very typical German Shepherd. He's like, oh, you silly labs who like to play around. And then Hilo is my work partner, and Hilo actually started out in guide dog school, but he decided he didn't really want that job, um, so we call him a career change dog. By age of two, he came to join our program, and I like to say that uh, he left the United States to come work with us because we have much better health care system. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Stephanie. <laughs> uh, so we, um, our dogs live with us. They are integrated into our family, into our lives. They go to work with us every single day, whether it's the winter or whether it's boating season. And they're part of our, they're part of our lives because it's important that we have that trust. So these dogs, when we ask them to do something, they trust us that we're gonna ask them to do something that's safe. And if he's trying to tell me something, I'm able to understand what it is he's trying to tell me about when he's detecting something on a boat. Uh, we make our dogs wear these little booties so they won't scratch anyone's boat. So you can see uh, Diesel's really thrilled about having to put his <laughs> booties on there. That's a face he gives every time. And uh, we really want to encourage people to stop at our inspection station. So we're very clear that we're only looking for muscles. We're not looking for anything else that you may have on your boat. So please stop. We're just environmentalists. And I'm going to show you a little video now that uh, just shows you the process of what it's like when we uh, inspect a boat, when our dogs inspect a boat. So we really do get a lot of public uh, media attention from having the dogs, which is a huge bonus. Like we have probably had, you know, a million dollars worth of free public education because the media is so attracted to the idea of having cute dogs. And it's, we've had the New York Times came to Alberta to do a story about the dogs. We've had a station from Colorado flew up to Medicine Hat, Alberta. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it probably wasn't a direct flight from Colorado, and it's not <laughs> super exciting. And, you know, so um, we've done all kinds of primetime um, uh, TV and whatnot. So they really do have that PR ability and reach out to people who normally maybe would not have heard about this invasive muscle issue. Um, this is the Minister of Al uh, Alberta Minister of Environment and Parks, and we had an event on the steps of the legislature, so he's shaking her hand there. So we've had support all the way up to the very top about this program. Um, and so then when Montana uh, tested positive in Tiber Canyon, we thought this would be a really neat opportunity to, to cross-train the dogs as a response tool, because if you get positive and you have veligers or the microscopic muscles in a water body, that's one thing. You can, you can maintain that status for several years without seeing the huge, huge economic impact that could happen. However, as soon as you find that first adult muscle, it's a game changer as far as management actions are concerned. So what we wanted to do was try and train the dogs to help to go to locations like Mo Montana and search for those um, 
adult mussels that could be along a shore. So it was kind of neat because our dogs were used to a really intense, focused search on a boat, which is like super quick. And now we're like, okay, we're going to train you to go along a shore, along a beach, which, you know, labs love to swim, and uh, look for these invasive mussels. So we went down to Lake Powell in uh, Utah and uh, we were successful in training all three of our dogs to detect invasive mussels on shorelines now, which will be used in any kind of rapid response for any province and state. Um, and as I said, these dogs are so obsessed with water, and yet they were still able to maintain their focus and just look for the mussels that they were trained to do. So here's the dog paw print. That pen is pointing to the tiny little mussel that the dogs were able to find on the beach like that. So it's pretty incredible, the focus. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit quickly about something I'm proud of. We've trained the dogs to now detect an invasive weed. So we've gone from aquatics to terrestrial invasives now. And so there's an invasive weed called Thesium arvense. The only known location of this invasive weed in all of Canada is in Alberta in one of our provincial parks. And this weed is pretty low growing, it's hard to see, it's kind of spindly, and it grows in amongst all these other tall grasses. And we're like, how are we ever going to get a handle on the spread of this invasive weed when we don't even know how, how extensive it is. So we got an innovation grant and we, were, we brought in our contractors and in nine days we were able to train the dogs to find the weed in the middle of the park. So it was really incredible to watch and I have a, like, a really short video to show you how we train the dogs to detect that invasive weed. So remember, like tiny amount of odor on boat to here's a field with tall grasses and gophers and wind, and the dogs were able to, uh, to do it. So that was a really neat project. And so what our job is to go out there and uh, help map the extent of that weed. So our dogs aren't there to dig it up or anything like that. We're just there to find it, and then we'll bring in other people to work on the eradication. So next steps, um, we actually received a US Fish and Wildlife Services grant. And so the Alberta teams, along with the Montana dog teams, who are also, uh, they've also incorporated dogs into Montana last year. Uh, and so it's same trainers, same process, same, you know, community working together on these dogs. Um, so we're all going to go down to Texas and we're working with some professors from Portland State University and we are going to uh, hopefully train the dogs to detect microscopic mussels in water which will be pretty amazing. So the idea isn't that they're going to go sniff around a lake for the microscopic, but what they're going to do is sniff boats for those places that uh, water would be draining out of on some of these very fancy and complicated houseboats and whatnot to see if the larva is indeed in those stages. So we'll see whether or not that, uh, I'll be able to report on the results of that, I guess, uh, by this time next year. Okay, let's go find it. Oh, good boy, let's go find it. Good searching. Check here. Good searching. That's right. Oh, good job. Check here. What is it? Show me. Show me. Can you touch? Can you touch? <gasps> yes! Good boy! 